minutes after two minutes after six and there's a recording in progress and so if you don't want to be recorded um then exercise your options but otherwise we're going to save this as part of our community knowledge system uh and i guess we'll wait till about maybe uh another minute or so we got 15 people, I think that's a pretty good critical mass. All right. Well, uh, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started. Um, if everybody would like to introduce themselves in the chat, Feel free to do that, um, and we'll get started here very shortly. And once again, the meeting is being recorded, and this is part of the Speaking Up for Point Malate series uh, being sponsored by the Point Malate Alliance, of which uh, myself, Andres Soto, I am one of the co-chairs and uh, one of my other co-chairs are here. So uh, maybe for the interest of the audience, those of us who are involved directly in this evening, I'm thinking Danny, Sally, uh, Pam, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, why don't you go ahead and do that right now? Sure, hi. Yeah, hi, I'm um, a co-chair of the Point Melody Alliance. I'm also a co-chair of the Shoreline Alliance, uh, I'm on the board of Citizens Free Shore Parks, Parks, a member of the Richmond Progressive Alliance, and I'm a co-founder and co-host of this series with Sally Tobin. Sally? Um, so I'm Sally Tobin. Um, as Pam said, I'm co-founder and co-host of this series. Um, and I also work with the Point Malate Alliance and the Richmond Shoreline Alliance, and I'm on the board of Citizens for East Shore Parks. Um, I'm basically a biologist, so I really appreciate Point Malate, which, and I got to know Point Malate as a kayaker. It's really a cool place. So, Danny. Hey everyone, I'm Danny Zaki. I use she or they pronouns. Uh, I'm an organizer with the San Francisco Bay chapter of Sierra Club. I am running all things Zoom. So if you need any help with tech, anything, uh, please let me know in the chat. I'm happy to be here. Cool. Well, uh, well, thank you guys. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to help out here. And um, so this you know, series is about having local community folks speak to other local community folks to address key issues and key questions about Point Malate. It's been a long struggle. I myself personally have been involved for uh, 19 years in this effort to try to save Point Malate. And we will be having a period for questions and answers. But before we get started, we want to do a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that West Contra Costa County and all the way down to the East Bay, all the way down to Carmel was the Ohlone territory and is unceded Ohlone territory. Uh, in Richmond and most of the Northeast Bay, uh, we had the Huchun Ohlone uh, people and they, like many other California uh, communities, were um, initially devastated by Spanish colonialism and the mission system, and then later on under the American system and the uh, bounty that was placed on the heads of Native Americans as the so-called 49ers uh, came into California. The Ohlone are still with us, and they are a part of our coalition and they merit our respect and acknowledgement for the survival and the persistence of their culture and their ancestors. So to give you an overview of our meeting today, uh, the speakers will present for about 40 minutes and then we will have the uh, uh, question and answer period. And uh, 
you know, we know that in a lot of these conversations, people want to put some context to the questions. We're asking you to try to make your question in any context uh, in less than one minute so we can have time for the uh, presenters to answer those questions. Um, and we invite you to ask sincere questions uh, asked with courtesy and respect. And um, if someone acts inappropriate, uh, belligerent, disruptive, uh, this is an electronic meeting, so we won't need our bodyguards to secure the meeting. We'll just boot you out. Uh, also, uh, please use the chat feature to let us know how we can improve or to leave your email if you would like us to send you announcements directly. All chat will appear in the recording. And um, I uh, will have somebody put up the web page uh, for the speaker series in the chat. I guess that would be uh, uh, Danny there. And uh, then we will, uh, you know, this session and few search sessions will be recorded and eventually posted to that page. But in the meantime, you can go to Speaking Up uh, YouTube channel for recordings of previous sessions. And there is a link to that that will also be put in the chat. Uh, the next session is August 1st and will be presented, the presentation will be conducted by the Watershed Project, another local EJ organization. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm Andres Soto, one of the co-chairs of the uh, Point Malati Alliance, just retired as an organizer with Communities for a Better Environment, one of the co-founders of the Richmond Progressive Alliance, former Richmond Planning Commissioner, uh, dot, 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 dot. Enough about me. So I would like to uh, first introduce uh, Sally Tobin. As she mentioned, she is a biologist and retired from the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Oh, that's something we could use more of. She uh, works with the Point Malati Alliance and the Richmond Shoreline Alliance and is a member of Bay Area Sea Kayakers. And she serves on the board of Citizens for East Shore Parks and lives in the beautiful city of Richmond. We also have Pam Stello. Uh, she mentioned before, she's the co-chair of the Point Malati Alliance and the Richmond Shoreline Alliance and serves on the board of uh, Citizens for East Shore Parks. And she also lives in the wonderful city of Richmond. And so uh, why don't we go first uh, to our presenters and I'm gonna, I believe uh, Pam, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Sally, you're gonna go first, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So I turn it over to you. All right, here we go. Thank you, Andres. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, I think you need yes. to go to the presentation mode. All right. Why don't, why don't you try clicking on slideshow and then it should it just go straight ahead. Okay, slideshow, play presenter from, view. No, play from the start. Play from the start, cool. Okay, fabulous. Does that work for everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. All right. Okay, so, so my mission tonight is to explain the nuts and bolts of using the power of your own voice at Richmond City Council meetings. And this, these principles will also apply to all kinds of other meetings. Um, and so we're hoping that this will uh, help develop people who are willing to um, stand up and speak for what they believe in. After, after I speak, then Pam will accelerate way beyond the nuts and bolts to open a, a whole universe of personal connections. So the uh, pre-COVID era was a simpler time. All you had to do was go to City Hall, write on a piece of paper, get called upon, and then stand up and speak to the council with your friends behind you. But I'm gonna talk about how to speak to the Richmond City Council under today's COVID conditions. Um, 
and I'm going to come back to this uh, a couple of times, but at each city council meeting, there are three possible times for members of the public to speak. There's open session before closed session, and then there's open forum before open session, and then it's possible for people to speak on an item that's listed on the agenda. So more about those three opportunities later. City Council meetings are usually held at 6.30 p.m. on the first, third, and fourth Tuesdays of the month, and the agenda for the meetings is usually posted on Thursday evenings, but sometimes not until Friday morning. So how do you find out what's wrong, what's on the agenda? So we're going to just work through this process, um, uh, and, and I'll just kind of show you what I do. So the first thing I do is um, to find the city council agenda by doing a Google search. So in this case, I've, um, I've Googled agenda city council Richmond CA. And the CA is important because otherwise you'll get Richmond, Virginia. So then you click on the link and that takes you to a page from the city of Richmond's website. And it says council agenda documents. And there's an item right here that you probably can't read that says uh, upcoming agenda packet. And if you click on the upcoming agenda packet, then you get a calendar, which is kind of confusing. So, but, and, and the other part that's confusing is that the meeting time is listed at 4 p.m. But we're going to use um, tomorrow's city council meeting as an example. So you know you want July 26th and it's the only item you can click on. So if you click on that particular item, then that takes you to another uh, web page with, um, with the calendar kind of grayed out. And there are uh, basically three alternatives listed on your screen. One of those is the agenda in Spanish, which is a great thing. And then there's an a, a agenda um, um, cover page, which actually is, uh, this week it's 15 pages long, uh, that is just a compact version of the agenda. And then there are two other agenda versions uh, listed that I'll talk about a little later. One of those is PDF and the other one is HTML. Okay, so if so, we're going to look at the 15-page PDF file for the agenda cover page first. Um, and the first thing that comes up in that um, uh, summary is the open session to hear public comment before closed session. And and so so. The closed session is a session of the city council meeting where they talk about um, things that need to be confidential like lawsuits and employee uh, matters and salaries and hiring and, um, and choices like that. And so the public is not allowed to speak, uh, is not allowed to be there for those discussions, but you can speak about those items before the meeting starts. All right. And, and so then the, the um, next item as you page through the agenda cover page is the Richmond Housing Authority meeting, which is at 6.25 PM. Um, and then as you keep paging through, you get the agenda cover page of for the city council meeting, which is actually at 6.30 PM, like it's supposed to be. And, um, and you'll notice if you can read it on your screen that there is that um, item V is open forum for public uh, comment. So that's uh, the second place where you can comment 
uh, as part of the actual city council meeting. All right. And, and it's also possible to scroll down through this agenda cover page and you can look for the item that you're interested in. So in this case, I've just singled out uh, an item called phase one of the Keller Beach Sanitary Se Sewer Feasibility Study because who's not interested in sewers? Um, and it shows you that the item is there and it's listed on the agenda. Um, but that doesn't give you any more information other than just this really short summary. And to get the rest of the information, you need to go back to the council meeting page, the one where the items are superimposed on the grayed out calendar. Um, and so now you have a choice between the HTML item um, and the PDF item. Um, and this particular week, the uh, PDF item is 2,464 pages long because it includes all of the supporting documentation in the same entire document. So I usually choose the HTML item um, and you can see that in the next slide, um, which has the same summary that you saw in the uh, overview of the agenda, but there's this uh, wonderful little paper clip over here to the side. And if you uh, click on that paper clip, if you clip on that paper clip, if you click on the paper clip, then you will see this screen. And all of a sudden you've got all the information that you need. These are, uh, these attachments over on the right are of all the documentation that city staff thinks is relevant to this particular item. And so now you can act, you can click on each of these attachments in turn and take a look at them. And you can use that information to inform the public comments that you're going to write. So, um, so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, because we're gonna just, I'm just gonna talk my way through the rest of it. Um, okay, so when you're going through the, um, the summary for the city council meeting agenda, that also generally gives you um, an order in which the items will come up before the city council. But one of the things the city council does early in the meeting is conduct a quick agenda review. So sometimes that ends up completely rearranging the order in which items are brought up. So you, you probably need to um, log on and make sure your item is going to come up you know, in a particular time frame, um, rather than just logging on later and finding out that your item has been, uh, has already been considered. Okay, so in, uh, in city council meeting um, meetings, there are limitations. And this always kind of reminds me of um, Cinderella in that you're squeezing your message into the limitations. Um, so, the um, the whens are the public comment before the closed session or the public forum before the open session or the public speakers for agenda items. And how long is um, the usual time is two minutes. Uh, sometimes if there are lots of speakers, it can be one minute. And for public hearings, it's three minutes. Now it's it's a lot harder to do a short talk than it is for a long talk. There's no luxury of time. Uh, Andres can probably speak off the cuff for precisely one minute and 59 seconds, but I am not able to do that. So, so here's what I do in terms of preparing comments. Um, so if there are 75 ways to do the dishes, there must be thousands of ways to prepare a short talk, but uh, I tend to focus on a story. Some people wax poetic, some express emotion, whatever works for you. 
but I start by writing out my comments and then I read them out loud to myself with a timer, which is really painful. Um, and sometimes I, I paste comments into a website called Word Count to figure out how many words I can say in two minutes. And then I can adjust the length to avoid too many episodes of reading out loud to the timer. And then I edit and then I re-edit and, and I, I say my comments out loud because it's always a surprise that written comments may not sound right when they're spoken. Um, and I post a copy of my talk on screen, but you can also print it out and speak from there. So how to deal with Zoom. Um, I don't have time to cover phone participation, but my impression from city council meetings is that it is less reliable than a computer or a smartphone because maybe half the time when speakers are called by the last four digits of their phone number, there is not a successful connection. So at the city council meetings, the chat function is disabled. Um, everybody is muted, all, or at least all the attendees are muted until you speak. Your camera is disabled, so no one can see you. This can be helpful for people who are nervous about public speaking. Um, and so then the next thing you need to um, think about is when do you raise your electronic hand? Uh, and the hand is located under reactions uh, if you're um, a Zoom neophyte, but there aren't very many Zoom neophytes left. Um, now, the city's video guide that gets played before every city council meeting says that the mayor will call for public speakers. But in practice, he simply asks the city clerk, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have speakers? And if she says no, because no one has raised their hand fast enough, then any speaking opportunity has just evaporated. So back to those three opportunities to speak. Um, for the open session to hear public comment before the closed session, get that hand up immediately at the start of the meeting because public comments are absolutely first. You can speak on any item that's listed on the closed session agenda. Um, possibility two is in the open forum for public comment at the regular meeting of the Richmond City Council. The open forum occurs after reports by the city attorney and the police department. So you can actually raise your hand during those reports. The open forum is for any matter that is not on the agenda. Um, but number three is if you're speaking about an agenda item, then you need to wait until that item comes up, even if it comes up after 11 p.m. It can be good insurance to send email comments to council members before the deadline of 1 p.m. the day of the meeting, in case the meeting goes later, you have an emergency. Um, the agenda tells you how. And if you are still awake when your item is considered, you can still speak even though you submitted written comments. You're just not allowed to speak twice on the exact same item. So if you are speaking on an agenda item, then the item will be announced and raise your hand when the item is announced and then it's discussed by council members and then those with raised hands are called. Um, when your name is called, you'll get a pop-up that asks you to unmute yourself. Then there is a timer bar across your screen and ideally, you would have already written your comments and rehearsed so that you know you can fit them into the time limit. You deliver your comments and then you are done. You have contributed to democracy in Richmond. So is talking better than sending an email or commenting online? Um, in my opinion, it's really best if you talk because even though you are a faceless voice, voice the fact that you care will come through. You can think of it as radio, uh, which is uh, a medium that, that uh, still exists, but was there before TV was invented. Um, you can share with more community members if you speak than if you submit comments. You give life to your ideas. Um, you say what the community is thinking. And by doing so, you do the environment and the city council a favor. Um, you can tell a story especially a personal story, um, 
one time I told a story about my brother roping bulls uh, off the highway in Port Angeles, Washington, because it was relevant to um, the uh, CFD uh, bond um, proposal auction. Um, the more people take time to work their way through the system to comment, the more the city council knows that this is an issue that people care about. So in my opinion, give the council the benefit of hearing your voice. So thanks very much. Um, and uh, now it's up to Pam. Pam? Hi, thank you, Sally. I just wanted to add on to what Sally said um, that the, well, the, the um, Citizens for Sustainable Point Malati, which is how I came to Point Malate in 2009, um, was an organization fighting a casino that was proposed for Point Malate. And that organization was founded by all of us speaking to the county commission. And uh, we met afterwards, after we spoke, we recognized that we had the same shared values and the same shared fight. And we met outside and we founded uh, Citizens uh, for Sustainable Point Malate. That uh, has since uh, become the, uh, the um, Point Malati Alliance. And it's grown and it's grown immensely. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about. So I, I want to um, speak now just about what is a, a successful social media campaign? And um, I'm gonna move just to my first slide and let me share. So the question I want to address is how do we bring attention to and communicate to diverse audiences, complex political and environmental issues? And this has really been our task as uh, the Point Malate Alliance. And I, I, I won't be speaking to everything that we've done right, but I'll be speaking to what we've learned. We, um, we've been very fortunate to have incredible talent come to this, to this struggle. And I think a foundation that's allowed many people to come to the struggle and bring their talents to the struggle has been consistent messaging from the beginning, from 2004, when Andre started, to 2009, to then 2016. Um, these different phases has always been save Point Malate. And that's been the umbrella. So we've had the consistent messaging, but we need meaningful content and content, I think I wanna say that proves the messaging. And I think this image by Jack Scheinman is a perfect example of that on social media. Um, this is actually um, not a sea otter. It's a freshwater otter that was at Point Malate. Jack caught a number of wonderful images that almost went viral. They, um, they've got thousands of hits and went across all the platforms that we're on. And they also started a big conversation on Nextdoor among people who I'd never seen engaged in Point Malati before. But part of our messaging has always been that Point Malati is unique. One of the reasons to save it is it has unique habitat, unique wildlife. And this image captures that. This proves and supports our messaging. And I think that that's part of the power of this image um, that Jack um, captured. And, and part of our social um, media campaign um, became much more powerful across platforms when Jack and Jeff Peterson, two uh, photographers, joined us and started capturing these images. Um, as uh, Linda Hunter of the Oyster uh, Project said, and, and David Helvarg, I think they said it simultaneously, uh, that Point Malati is the most beautiful place nobody's ever seen. And that's what it was like when in 2004 and even 2009. And when these photographers came forward, they changed that. And they also gave meaning to the consistent messagings that we've had over time. That's, that is so important for a successful social media campaign. It's also important for a social media campaign of who's communicating the message. Um, there's all kinds of stakeholders for every campaign. For Point Malati, we have many stakeholders. Uh, Courtney Cummings pictured at the uh, bio blitz that was um, held at, recently at Point Malati. Um, actually, this was Earth Day, I apologize. Um, 
she um, she founded the Richmond Powwow. She's also the um, the Point Malati, the representative, the Richmond representative for Point Malati for the Confederated Villages of Lijan. And her um, image, of course, has, has had many, um, many likes on many different platforms, but also a video that she did early on has had thousands of views. And I think that, you know, the tools that we have are the videos, the photos, um, and, but it's the, um, it's the authenticity of those and who's speaking and who are they speaking for and for what, for what are they speaking, for what future, um, in this case, for Point Malate and for Richmond. And it's very important um, for a successful media campaign to engage all the stakeholders and for those stakeholders to speak their truth. And this is part of the the communication of a social media campaign because it's part of the understanding of the campaign. How do you communicate complex political and um, and environmental issues? Well, how you communicate them is at the level of of communities where there's shared history, shared knowledge, shared values, and that's part of the power of of Courtney's um, of video, but. Of course, it went beyond those boundaries, but every all stakeholders need to commu be communicating their own truth and their own ideas uh, for a successful media campaign, for one that goes broadly um, for through an ever expanding audience. Multimodal, when we talk about multimodal messaging, we often think of it as well, you know, I think I'll start on Twitter as well as Instagram and I'll do Facebook and Reddit. Um, but multimodal messaging, in order for it to, to be comprehensive in terms of understanding, um, needs to, to include hard copy as well. This is just one example. In, in terms of our campaigns, many people are out tabling, uh, you know, even now. Uh, of course, much of that stopped because of COVID, but prior to COVID, people attended events talk to their neighbors um, at different events and join many different organizations um, to talk about Point Malate. Um, but the, so by allowing an organization to all the stakeholders to sort of take their knowledge, their messaging and their values to communicate it in the ways that, that have meaning to them, under an umbrella of a very consistent message, then th this is a perfect example where a group steps forward and they create a newspaper. This newspaper covers many Richmond issues, but it also took on Point Malate issues and was significant to our campaign and our social media campaign because the complex issues need multimodal messaging. Reddit has its own, you know, communicates to its own groups, but also allows and limits certain times of communications as do all the other social media campaigns. But when done together with longer articles um, that a newspaper can provide and one that can provide to people that are not on social media, that um, that is incredibly significant um, because it brought so many more people to um, Point Malati and so much deeper understanding of the issues that Point Malati represents. Another important aspect of a social media campaign is to understand your audience. Um, and, and so one of the audiences of a social media campaign is, are the people who make the decisions. So it's important to understand who they are, who influences them, who, um, what are their values? Uh, what, what are their investment in, in the campaign that you're running? How do they perceive of it? Um, how can they be persuaded and, and how can they come to understand um, what you're trying to communicate? And the empower, the power map is intentionally blank because um, it changes all the time. It will, it, it, it has changed so much through this campaign or who are the decision makers? Um, and, um, and of course we learn more and we learn who are, who are influencing the decision makers. And so we, it changes consistently, constantly, but it does, is a very important part of a social media campaign and, and, um, and to be updating it and to be communicating it and for people to understand uh, who can make uh, the change that a campaign seeks to make. Um, 
So I guess in terms of what we've learned from all these years of running a social media campaign um, and starting with really not understanding it at all and having to do it through experience is that, that it's the person to person uh, relations that bring success. Um, it's these networks, it's, it's how different people came forward that understood the strengths of Twitter or understood the strengths of, that was Amanda Lucas or understood the strengths of Instagram, that was Jack Scheinman. Um, understood how to do that sort of quick messaging on Facebook. That's Tony Hanna and Jeannie Court. And this is, th these people, when, when you allow room for people to bring their talents to a campaign, they bring, they step up and they bring talents that some didn't know they had and, and others that, that we, that all, every campaign needs. Some of the organizations that, um, that appreciate Point Malate and, and are, are, have been working for years as well. This is just a, a short list. Um, and and I, I won't read through the whole list, but what's important about this list is that these, these groups are doing their own messaging to their own communities about why Saving Point Malate is important, about what were the hazards of the housing development that was put forward. Um, those were communicated um, you know, through through these groups own knowledge base. And, and, and that's very important for communities that then and individuals that then come to social media and that they understand the content. They understand it and they know it and, it, and it's meaningful because they've come to understand it through the organizations and the people that they care about and that are communicating to them um, through a shared history um, and through shared, um, shared experiences. So what can anyone here do to create a successful media campaign? And it may be not what people you know, may originally think that they need to do. And it's participate in organizations. That's what we've learned um, in this two decade fight. Um, sign up for notifications and newsletters because if you do, you know what's going on. And, and you get and you understand what the talking points are, what the strategies are, what and what the risks are, and you can contribute to those strategies. Um, speak up um, at hearings and meetings, go to events like bio blitzes, but create events. Um, Contra Costa College students, um, I saw on social media, uh, organized a cleanup at Point Malate. It was one, wonderful. There was a, wonderful photos. Urban Tilth, a, a group from Urban Tilth, organized a cleanup at Point Malate. So once people are engaged, um, they go ahead and they create new meanings and they also create new activities that bring new people to the campaign and to understanding the social media um, that's being um, put forward through the various platforms. Um, there's also bringing your talents. Um, many people that by, by opening it up and letting people have a chance to, to speak or to, um, to write, we they find that they're great writers or they're great speakers or over time become so. And so allowing room for people to come in and to work at it and get better at it is also a really important part of the social media campaign um, and, and the, in the entire campaign. Use your voice whenever you can with friends and neighbors. Um, and also, I think spend pot time at Point Malate because if you do and you spend time with the different organizations, you in fact may well, as many of us have, find things that we didn't, that, that weren't already identified in the campaign as important, or you find the talent that, that you can bring to this campaign. And, and we find that it's largely through those person to person interactions. Thousands of miles relay. Um, it's been, you know, brought to my attention, and this is nothing new. That there's a um, a campaign against the Richmond Progressive Alliance um, by the Coronado Neighborhood Council. Um, a, a very dishonest campaign. There's one as well. There have been many against the Point Malati Alliance. And when I was thinking about this. Um, I think you know we've survived many of these campaigns, and I think the reason is because we are running the thousands of miles relay uh, through person-to-person -person relations, and we're in it for the long run 
And it's much easier to lie than tell the truth. And the work that it takes to tell the truth unifies a campaign and, it, and creates close relations, but also it's, it's how we learn. It's how we, we learn through that relay race. And I just, I wanna close because something I, when I was thinking about the relay race, I was thinking about the, um, the Native American youth at Standing Rock and they ran 2000 miles, a 2000 mile relay race to Washington DC. And, and it was done of course, to raise awareness um, about the pipeline. But, and I thought, wow, that's a great symbol. Um, for a social media campaign, but it isn't. It is a social media campaign. A social media, the rock of a social media campaign, the only way it can exist um, and be successful, but exist is by those person-to-person -person relations, by joining organizations and by joining the thousand miles relay. Um, it's always a long haul uh, for these kinds of fights. Thank you. Well, thank you both, uh, both Pam and Sally. Uh, clearly, uh, you have a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge. And, uh, you know, I think that metaphor of the long term relay, you know, as, as we're preparing for this relocation, I was thinking about that 19 years I've been involved with this Point Malate struggle. And, uh, and, and yet we are way uh, it, it's been a long struggle but we systematically and 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 uh you know very methodically have gotten to the point where we're in a very good position so thank you both um now is the time that we open it up for questions so if you would like to ask a question please raise your hand and i and i think i will i will be the one possibly who will ask you to unmute uh, once I see your hand up, if you'd like to ask a question of either, uh, either of our presenters. So uh, Jeannie, why don't you go first? I think I just, there you go. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, the presentation was, was really great um, and very informative. And, um, you know, I just, um, been involved in this fight and this process myself for uh, almost 20 years. So um, anyway, I just wanted to point out, um, and, you know, Sally was talking about the city council meetings and those of you who are um, shy, <laughs> I, I just wanted to point out that uh, on Zoom, you are not seen, you're just heard. So those who, you know, are, are, or a little, I know some people say, well, I'd rather die than speak in public. Um, they, they only hear you, they can't see you. So um, I just wanted to, to mention that. So thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, uh, I, oh, go ahead, Sally, you wanna- um, I have a friend who is fond of saying that, you know, as far as public speaking, that the audience can't eat you. <laughs> you know, and and so this time you're extra safe because they can't even see you. Um, so it's not like an open Zoom meeting like this. They just have it set up so that your um, your individual cameras are off. And, you know, I think one thing we should keep in mind is that when it comes to the city council meeting, generally things are already figured out and sorted out. So it's really an opportunity for advocacy uh people because the groundwork for making a decision is laid out in the communication with uh, city council members and staff long before it comes to the city council meeting and so the council meeting is really more like the formal process almost the theater of decision making and so that's why effective public speaking uh you know is really from the heart it doesn't matter how great a speaker you are, it's the sincerity of your comments. Um, I see, Danny, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, Pam and Sally what what you both think this movement needs, like what uh, what other folks can do with, you know, like using their talents. Like, are you looking for anything in particular 
um, or how are the ways everyday folks can engage? Do you want me to, Sally? Um, you, you go ahead and start and then I'll chime in. Yeah, so there's always, that we always need more help. So any, we need help with the actual social media platforms. We need writers. Uh, we need artists, and and I didn't bring up art, but art's such an important part of this. Just the Jeannie Quartz's art of Point Melody Beach Park behind me, um, Jeannie, and Jeannie has her own art behind her as well. But um, and and as well, joining. I listed all the organizations. There's. Um, you can join our organization and come in, and there's always work to be done. But there's also um, Sierra Club is, is doing a lot for Point Malate. Uh, Rich City Rides, supporting the list that, that I put up and, and joining them and talking about Point Malate, that's also really important. And I think the thing I've learned is the super important thing is that people join where their interests intersect, where their communities intersect. Um, and, and I guess I'll just add a couple of things. Um, the there is now Pam showed a photo of the front page of the original um, newspaper um, edition of the Richmond Community News, um, but now there is a digital version because it basically cost twenty five thousand dollars to put out a print edition and print it out and deliver it to everybody. Um, so even though that's a very effective way, we have started a digital edition. And so especially people who, who see things and would like to write about them, you know, please contact either, either Pam or me or other people. And, and if you'd like to write up something for the Richmond Community News, you know, that's fabulous. We need more writers. Um, and another um, talent that we seem to need more of is um, people who can, um, who are uh, graphic designers or who are, um, who manage websites. You know, those are really important functions these days. So if you want to volunteer your talents in either of those areas, that would be very much appreciated. Yeah, thank you for that. And then of course, all of this is done through a political process. So ensuring that we have the right council members in place and finally getting rid of the mayor that we have is a critical agenda item over the next several months. And with that, I see Jammin, your hand up. Speaking of trying to get us on the right path. Hey, Andres. Um, so uh, one, this was a really great um, presentation because I feel like a lot of people do feel that engaging with city council can be very difficult and very intimidating. And so um, I really appreciate how you really laid out how simple it is, especially now, um, and it made it feel really engaging. Um, and um, as well, I wanted to, um, I guess my, my question is, um, if somebody did, have uh, art or or like what it does does some if somebody has art or they want to have or they have uh, poetry or they have other forms of ways that they engage in activism um, it the organization is is really open to taking everyone that's correct like you don't all you don't have to be at every protest it's like it, it you have you allow people to give the what time they can and it's about the collection. Is that right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah because um, I, you know, there's a lot of things around Point Pilate and um, and especially this year, there's been I've been spending a lot more time there because of how things have been heating up. But um, I, they're going to them all does seem overwhelming. So I'm, I'm really I'm glad to hear that because there's so many different ways that you want to engage and like. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. And, oh, go ahead. Finish your finish your thought. I'm sorry. Oh, and I just wanted to say um, I I'm looking forward to seeing how things are going to be going because, as well, I will say that at least in my experience, I don't like to argue on social media, but having all those articles available to be able to pull quotes from has been invaluable to be able to um, 
you don't rather than engaging in an argument you just put this is the facts of the matter and like engage them on the points rather than on the uh personalities mm -hmm. so, yeah. i really appreciate it. one of the things that has complicated this process and and has drawn it out for so long is uh the various uh litigation uh you know strands that have been going on for years and uh, a lot of that is wrapped up but most importantly is that you know where we're at now is it looks like there's an opportunity with this state funding coming down to match with some local funding uh, to uh, finally make the the final step to uh, having this be bought and uh, you know by the East Bay Regional Park District and to uh, you know finally uh, begin to implement you know the vision and the dreams of the people of the community uh, that we've been fighting for. So we're not there yet. And that's why this is going to be one of the key issues in this upcoming city council race. So we've already seen where Mr. Phillips has criticized uh, this decision and he wants to be mayor. And we know some of the other characters who are out there. So uh, I think the more that we're informed and can show up at candidates forums and ask the pointed question, you know, why would you support a failed project that was, you know, designed to uh, rip off the people of Richmond and uh, see what they say about it. So um, we are now down to about seven minutes. More questions, please. Or if you want to offer commentary, yes, go ahead, Pam. I wanted to just add to what you said. Um, another important reason for continuing to um, to expand uh, our campaign is that when for in order for the park to represent the people of Richmond and the needs of the people of Richmond, people need to be engaged in the planning process. And to be engaged in that planning process is very important that people understand the possibilities and the limitations of the property. We have a community plan that is basically all the elements of it grew out of uh, out of community meetings and, and ironically, it, even out of the, uh, the city's own planning meetings. And it's on the Point Melody Alliance website. And it does give um, uh, some you know, understanding of what's, what's possible at the site, some of the possibilities as well as limitations of the property. Um, and let me add to that, that um, there was a planning process that was um, uh, basically directed at development, but it was not an unbiased planning process. So we need to have a, a, a new planning process and, and really uh, engage all the neighborhoods and communities in Richmond uh, and also in the region because it will become a regional park um, and, and really engage everybody and um, incorporate as many um, forward-looking ideas as we possibly can. Yeah, and I and I think uh, you know if, if people have some more questions, please raise your hand. Or if you would like to make a comment that is relevant to this discussion, uh, please do so. We have about five more minutes left. Um, uh, do I see Jamin's hand again? Yes, please, Jamin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just also want to say that, you know, the while we're all looking forward to the purchase of the park, that there's still going to be a lot of work still left to do, making sure that that park is going to be, uh, that is going to serve the, the it, that it's going to be serving the city of Richmond, and it's going to be serving the, what people want. Um, there's been a number of, of uh, I, ideas of how to resolve that, but we are, this is just good news, but on the crest, the crest of, a, of the horizon. And so uh, there is going to be a lot more work to do. So don't think that like when you hear, oh, it's been purchased, like this is the Point Melody Alliance is going away. I think it's going to be around for, for some time. And even if it is just remembering the hard work that all of you guys have been doing for so long and uh, celebrating when it is when the, it is finally a park and it is finally established and everything. Um, I think there's a, there's still a lot of work to be done. And um, so a lot of ways people can engage. The, the, the fight's not over. It's just finally having a good turn. Yeah, and 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 I'll, uh, I want to come to Jeannie in a second, but I just want to follow up in your point and remind people that really there are two parts, at least two parts, maybe three parts to 
the Point Malate area that we're talking about. And that also includes Wine Haven, which does provide an opportunity for economic development somewhere down the line in the future. And there have been some community plans around that. Jeannie, please. There, I unmuted myself. Um, I just wanted to say that John Joya, when uh, he was uh, uh, speaking uh, for speaking up for, for Point Malati last week, he did mention that this, as, as Jamin had said, that this is going to be a, uh, a a process, and uh, he wants to get uh, the whole community involved and find out what people actually want uh, as far as a park at Point Malate. And, um, and so that's, uh, you know, a whole other thing. I, I, I assume, I don't know how that's gonna work out, but I'm sure we will get some information regarding that as, as we get further along in this process. So thank you. Yeah, I see Tony's hand up and then Pam. Tony, I'm, uh, let me see. Hi. Yeah, there you go. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I just want to say that I'm, I'm really grateful to be a part of this organization and what you're doing. Um, I've lived in Richmond for, well, a little bit over 30 years. And I think we have an opportunity um, to create a regional um, park that is the equivalent of, and I'm going to make a reach here because I know, I know there's a lot of hard work, but something the equivalent of the, you know, um, Central Park West. Um, it could be the, the Golden Gate Park. And I think that being part of Richmond is, is something really great for this community who have gotten so much, for a great city that have gotten such bad press at times. So I'm here for, in it for the long haul and um, I'll do whatever I can for the community. I live in Richmond. I've always lived in Richmond, you know, um, so... I totally support everything. And, and I know that I'm part of the, the group that's trying to build um, the soccer field, a sports complex over there. And the main goal is to give our youth something, some ownership to, the, to this community. And oftentimes when we build things and we design things, we don't include the, 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 the kids and kids grow up to be adults. And once we <laughs> have a proper foundation, we will have people that always give back. And so, I'm glad to be a part of this and um, thank you very much for letting me voice my comment. Well, thank you, Tony, for all that you've already done and all your contributions here to for, for the young people and for Point Malate. Uh, Pam, one final comment, and then I think we have to close it up, right? Yeah, I just wanna say that there's economic development opportunities in the wine haven, but parks bring millions of dollars a year to cities. They bring investment. And you can't even put um, you know, a price tag on what it will bring to the youth and families of Richmond, as I think Tony's touched on here. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, re reinforcing that. So um, I guess uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, look back in the chat for the links to the page on how to get more involved. And I want to thank Danny and Pam and Sally and everybody uh, for your participation and your contributions tonight. And uh, remember that next week there will be a presentation uh, uh, in this Speaking Up for Point Malate series, and it will be presented by the Watershed Project, which is extremely relevant to Point Malate, uh, which is why the headlands, the hillsides, is a watershed environment unto itself and is linked inextricably to the eelgrass beds that are just uh, in the water off the, uh, off the beach uh, in the whole uh, park area. So um, with that, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank all the speakers and, uh, you know, si se puede, all power to the people. <laughs> Thank you, Andres. <laughs> Thank you, Andres. All right. See you all later. Thank you.